Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Salman. I'm the uh, economics correspondent for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer on PBS. Uh, tonight in the Cambridge Forum, Jared Bernstein uh, discussing his new book, uh, Crunch, Why Do I Feel So Squeezed? Uh, though when he wrote the book, uh, Jared probably didn't anticipate that everyone in America would know the right answer. Uh, would also be so concerned they'd be dying to hear him anyway, but too scared about the crunch to buy the book. Uh, or for that matter, any book at all. Um, but at the Cambridge Forum tonight, you get to hear him for nothing. Um, in the book, as in real life, Jared focuses on how economics affects ordinary citizens. He says we've been living not in the ownership society, but the you're on your own society. He blames, among others, but most particularly the Darth Vaders with PhDs for the current crisis and brings us economics, brings his economics for the rest of us outlook to crunch why do I feel so squeezed. So a brief bio, then Jared will talk. He's senior economist, director of the Living Standards Program at the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., author of a previous book, All Together Now, Common Sense for a Fair Economy, co-author of eight editions of The State of a Working America, which EPI, the Economics Policy Institute, puts out every year uh, with voluminous data on where we are as a country economically. His work's regularly published in the American Prospect, LA Times, New York Times, and New York Daily News. Uh, that's what it says. Two columns. Two columns, all right. Uh, well, everybody's turning now, aren't they? Uh, Bernstein is a featured uh, weekly commentator for a variety of uh, weekly CNBC uh, programs and makes regular appearances on various NPR programs, including Morning Edition and Marketplace. And though he comes at economics from a so-called progressive point of view, he doesn't let ideology get in the way of his data, which is why I've admired him for a long time, or let ideology get in the way of his analysis of those data. So welcome to Cambridge Forum, Jared Bernstein. Thanks very much for, for the great introduction, and uh, both Pat and, and, and Paul. I have uh, really uh, appreciate your inviting me to come up here from Washington and, and speak today. I got in the, uh, the cab to go to the airport in D.C., and uh, somebody, uh, the, the cab driver, was listening to um, news radio, and someone said, you know, if this keeps up, we're likely to go into a recession. And this just set this cab driver off. And he started talking about how his wages haven't kept up with inflation. And I said, well, OK, now hold on. I happen to know a little bit about this. So uh, I'm going to see if this guy is blowing smoke. And so I said, well, just how much do you think your wages have gone up? And, and since when? And give me some, some background here. And he described the Bureau of Labor Statistics wage data perfectly. Uh, seasonally adjusted. I mean, this guy knew exactly what was going on with his paycheck, uh, which was going south quickly. So I get in the airplane, I fly out here, I get in, I get in the, and I'm not making this up, I get, everybody's talking, well, you'll, so I get in the cab at, at, at Logan, and uh, uh, it's, it's around 4.30, I guess the markets are just uh, closing, and, and, and Ben Bernanke is, is on the radio. And he's talking about how there's going to be these bank closures. And this cab driver says, I wish he would shut up already. <laughs> he's this guy Bernanke, he just talks too much. He's got to be more like Greenspan. Greenspan talked a lot, but nobody understood what the hell he was saying. <laughs> but this guy's getting out there. He's telling us everything that's going to happen. He's scaring everybody to death. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, Bernanke's whole thing was, I'm going to bring clarity to this job. And we all, we all thought that kind of made some sense. You know, uh, uh, Greenspan was, was, was known, you know, his famous quip was, if you understood me, I must have expressed myself poorly. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, Bernanke was going to bring certain transparency to the job. Well, maybe, maybe some people feel there's a little bit uh, too much of that. So anyway, I'm walking on my way here to the event. And uh, again, I, 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 this is uh, uh, my hand to God. This is what happened. And uh, I'm standing on the street corner right over here on Church Street. I'm standing next to this, the, these two women having a conversation. And one says to the other, I don't see how McCain can freeze spending and introduce a $300 billion program to buy home mortgages. And I was like, wow, you should really come to this talk, because uh, <laughs> anyway, let me, uh, 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 let me try to uh, segue a little bit into the book. But my, my point is that uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here talking about uh, the economy from, from uh, uh, the Crunchian perspective tonight, uh, because I do think uh, that we are obviously in a critical and in many ways unchartered uh, uh, territory. 
uh, in, in our economic evolution or devolution. And uh, my goal in life, not unlike Paul's, I think, if I may, if I may speak uh, for him, is to try to explain this stuff to the extent that I understand it uh, in ways that you understand it, and uh, which means I have the right to say I don't know. Uh, but uh, the goal of our, our get-together tonight is not for me to um, expound on uh, 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 my theories as much as to try to engage you in a discussion of the big economic questions of the day, and they're very pointed, big questions. Uh, before that, though, let me talk a little bit about the book. Um, I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes or so, and then I guess Paul and I will uh, uh, have a little discussion and bring in the audience. Um, my, uh, uh, in order to get us into the right spirit, I guess, instead of uh, being in this uh, 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 nice, bright room, beautiful street in Cambridge here, um, pretend that we're in the basement uh, uh, not, not, a, not on the first floor, but we're in the basement of a church where it's very smoky and very kind of dark, and there's this old stale coffee in the back of the room, and we're all looking pretty haggard, and I come up to the front of the room, and I start, <clears throat> my name is Jared, and I'm a practicing economist. I made my first graph decades ago, and while it sure felt good to see the way the bars lined up, I figured I could control the impulse. After a while, I was making several graphs and tables per hour and talking earnestly about inflation, supply and demand curves, Federal Reserve policy. I still thought I could stop whenever I wanted to. It hasn't worked out that way. In fact, it's gotten much worse. I now go on TV shows and have raging arguments about tax cuts, trade balances, the minimum wage and employment. Maybe you've seen me while you're flipping through the channels and maybe you've wondered whatever's got this guy so wound up. I'll tell you, economics has been hijacked by the rich and powerful, and it's been forged into a tool that's being used against the rest of us. Far too often, economists justify things many of us know to be wrong while claiming the things we believe are critically important can't be done. Maybe you've wondered whether all the tax cuts targeted at wealthy investors are really so necessary, especially given that we're spending borrowed money, only to be reminded that these tax cuts will spur investment and growth. Don't you get it, the story goes? We can't afford not to cut taxes. At most, you might muster the gumption to say, well, I'm not an economist, but that doesn't sound right to me. Well, I am an economist, and if I may ironically borrow a phrase from Ronald Reagan, I'm here to help. It doesn't sound right to me either, and that's because it's wrong. I'm tired of being stuck in the studio engaging in rants with Darth Vader's with PhDs. Wouldn't it be more useful to have an open-ended, rant-free dialogue with real everyday people about their economic questions? And if you agree with me that that would be better, then you've, uh, you've come to the right place tonight. By the way, uh, Paul said something about uh, how the title of the book might be altered if I knew what was going on. Well, actually, the original title of this book was um, Crunch. If the, economy, uh, if the economy's doing so well, why do I feel so squeezed? Uh, we lost the uh, if the economy is doing so well part um, uh, back uh, when the book came out in April. Uh, so uh, if that says anything about my forecasting abilities, let's just put that aside for now. The book uh, is a series of questions uh, drawn from uh, folks who were interested in having questions about the economy answered, just uh, the folks that the publisher surveyed. Um, and uh, when I wrote this book, uh, we didn't have, uh, we had a, a housing bubble that had burst, but we weren't where we are today. And so I thought I'd kind of put aside the actual questions uh, that I, I speak to in the book and talk about what I, I assume is uh, really pressing on every, everyone's thinking right now about this, which is uh, how the heck did we get here uh, economically? Where are we? Um, and to do so, I want to talk about where we were, where we are, where I think we're going. Because where we were actually has uh, a lot uh, to do with uh, where we are economically today as a country, particularly as it uh, reflects uh, the broad middle class. Um, <clears throat> the business cycle or the expansion, the period when the economy was growing, 
uh, over the 2000s, went from around uh, uh, early uh, uh, to uh, uh, late 2001. The uh, current uh, the expansion ended in November of 2000. Uh, I'm sorry, the recession, the last recession, ended in November of 2001, and probably went all the way to around December 2007. That that seems to be around when the economy entered entered a recession uh, early this year. Now th that call of whether we're actually in an official recession or not hasn't a, a, a been made by the group, it's actually a group right near here that uh, makes that call, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, although I did read today that one of their members, Robert Gordon, said yes, we're in a recession. So uh, the, uh, uh, that, that's really immaterial from the perspective of most people who are living economic conditions that are absolutely recessionary. The job market, for example, has um, contracted lost jobs for nine months in a row, and we've just never had nine months in a row of consecutive job losses without it ultimately being uh, uh, called a recession. So we're we're certainly in a recession, but again, it's an academic question that uh, puts a label on conditions that most people were, uh, are, are living with right now. The problem is, in terms of where were we, is that um, the uh, uh, American households are uniquely uninsulated uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 their economic conditions uh, to be facing a recession. Uh, over the course of this uh, uh, period, uh, something pretty unusual and even unprecedented occurred. Um, the economy expanded, GDP, the broadest measure of economic growth, uh, the uh, gross domestic product, you sum up the value of all the goods and services in the economy, every quarter that tends to grow. I mean, if it doesn't grow, then you're typically in a recession. And usually you're not, thankfully. Now we are. Uh, but the economy usually expands, and while it expands, uh, workers are more productive. Uh, that is, um, uh, workers, uh, the American workforce, um, uh, is uh, uh, taking the uh, inputs uh, and uh, creating the goods and services that people want, need, desire. And in fact, the uh, efficiency with which the American workforce did that was uh, uniquely high over this period of the 2000s. The workforce was uniquely productive. The rate of productivity growth is about 2.5% per year between 2000 and 2007. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but it really is. Uh, for about uh, a generation there, from uh, mid-70s to the mid-90s, productivity grew a point uh, uh, more, uh, uh, a point less quickly than that. And, and, and when productivity is growing at 2.5% per year, that actually means we have more, that much more output per hour of work. So you can imagine that if the American workforce is creating that much more output per hour of work, their living standards ought to be rising. Productivity maps onto living standards, one to one. That's what I was taught as a graduate student in economics. Uh, it ain't so. <laughs> uh, productivity growth creates the potential for higher living standards. But unless a set of conditions are in place, and I would argue that these conditions uh, might come under the rubric of distributional mechanisms, mechanisms that ensure a more equitable distribution of that productivity growth, unless those mechanisms are in place, are working, are functional, then the benefits of productivity growth flow uh, uh, to the top of the income scale. They don't f flow broadly throughout the income scale. Now, this is just another way of talking about this phenomenon of income or economic inequality. But let me give you one statistic, and I, I won't throw too many at you just in the context of, uh, of this talk, but this one is really uh, uh, very notable. Um, between 2000 and 2007, the median income, the income of middle income households, working age households, so these are people who are households headed by someone less than 65, so you want to look at families who probably have some connection to the job market. The median income of middle age households actually fell uh, about 3.5%. It actually fell in real terms $2,000. These families were in real terms $2,000 worse off in 2007 than they were in 2000, that is unprecedented. That never happened before. Now, we've had business cycles where families didn't get much better off. They were a little bit better at the end of the cycle than they were at the beginning, but never have they been worse off. The poverty rate, the nation's poverty rate, was over a percentage point higher in 2007 than it was in 2000. This is after a period, as I've told you, of really quite extraordinary productivity growth. Now, how does this happen? 
Well, the benefits of this growth accrue to the top of the scale. And as I speak to you today, the, uh, this is actually data from 2006, which is the most uh, recent data point we have, but this data series goes all the way back to 1913. The, if, if you line all the households up in this, in this economy, from the poorest to the richest, and you look at that top 1%, the richest 1% of households, right now they control 23% of all income. The top, as, as Joe Biden said, let me repeat that. Uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the top 1% the top of households now hold 23%. Now, how much is that? Well, in, fa in fact, uh, if you look at the 60s through the mid-70s, they, they had about 10%. So they have more than twice their share that they used to have. But there is only one year, one year on record in this historical economic record where the top 1% had a larger share of income than they do right, year, right now, and that year was 1928. Now that ended badly, and uh, I, I am not at all predicting that uh, we're looking at, at the, those similar kinds of uh, outcomes, although you actually do hear uh, far too many people, in my opinion, invoking the Great Depression right now. Um, I think there are many, many more backstops and policies to preclude that kind of a, a debacle. But I am saying that income and the distribution therein is as unbalanced now as it was then and, 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 and historically unprecedented levels. So that's, that's, the, that's one of the challenges that got us to where we are today. Now, how did families keep all this consumption going uh, over the 2000s. We know that over the 2000s, one thing that happened was we had a housing bubble and a lot of people bought homes. Well, uh, one of the ways, uh, the main way that happened was of course through borrowing. And <clears throat> one very, you know, if you had to ask for a sentence that explains what's going on in the American economy, uh, that sentence goes like this. Uh, we uh, uh, were over leveraged and now we're deleveraging. We borrowed too much and now we're uh, 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 paying the price and the system is uh, uh, resetting in a very uh, uh, painful and, and wrenching way. Um, but uh, I think that's probably a, a little bit too glib. I mean, one of the things that, that people often ask me about this is, they wait a second, I read in the newspaper that there are 3% of homes in foreclosure. You know, that means 97% aren't. How could it be that 3% of mortgages that default and enter foreclosure seem to set off a global recession? It just seems implausible, impossible. Well, uh, it, it, it's not. Um, we don't have a global recession yet, but we certainly have a threat of that. Um, and here's how I think that happened. The, it has a lot to do uh, with, with, with borrowing. The housing bubble, that is, um, housing prices became completely detached from the uh, fundamentals of what those prices should have been. If you look at um, uh, how hus housing prices have trended over time, you just see this mountain happen uh, over, uh, in, the, in, in the latter, two th uh, you know, start starting in, in, in the early 2000s and, and peaking around 2006 before it started coming down. Housing prices became uh, uh, completely detached from the rest of the economy. And, it, and I'm talking about the median housing price. I'm talking about the housing price for a, a middle income family buying a home. And if you plot, uh, if, if, you, if you just look at home prices for middle income people against their incomes, historically they kind of move together as you might expect. They sort of hard to imagine how they would diverge all that much for too long. But in fact, they did. Me, as I told you, median income actually fell for working age households, yet their, their home, uh, but home prices were going through the roof. Now, um, it so uh, there was a ton of borrowing going on, and people bought into the bubble. Now, so that still doesn't sound like it would necessarily uh, generate, you know, a disaster. But if you if you connect that to a set of quote innovative uh, uh, financial schemes that were um, uh, invented, promoted, came to fruition over this time, you begin to get a sense of what happened. So he, he, here's kind of a scenario. Um, I want to buy a house because I'm being told by lots of people that it's a hot housing market because I want to buy a house because housing is uh, by far the most uh, valuable uh, asset, the most 
valuable uh, uh, component of wealth for mo most middle income uh, people. So uh, it, that, there's nothing unusual about that. Um, and it, it turns out that to buy a house isn't that hard, uh, even if my income doesn't support it. Because I can go to this gentleman in, in front, and I hope you're not a real estate broker. I'm just going to pick on you and pretend you are. Um, uh, and if you are, you have my sympathy. Uh, but uh, I, uh, by the way, this cab driver on the way home, he was a former real estate broker. And he was, uh, he was telling me, you know, I, it was so close. I just had three more homes to flip, and it just didn't happen. Uh, but anyway. Uh, he, uh, 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 so I, I go to this gentleman and he says, you know, really don't worry about your income not, not matching uh, uh, what it says on this piece of paper because it, 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 the, 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 the thing is you're buying a house and houses rise in price 10, 12, 15% every year. You, my dear friend, are taking hold of an asset that is going to be a cash machine for you because every year it'll generate more wealth. Now, I say, great, sign me up, I, I enter the house. Now, what, why did this nut just sell me a house that he knows I can't afford? It, it, this didn't happen in the old days. When, when I went with my mommy to buy, I remember uh, my mom, when I was a little kid, she took me to the bank to buy the house. I just remember this for some reason. Maybe that's why I ended up where I am today. And, uh, you know, we sat there with the banker, miss, this guy I remember, you know, from the neighborhood, and he sold us the bank, and the loan sat in the vault, and we paid it off. No. What he does is he turns around and he, and he sells this loan to somebody else. So he's not really that worried about my ability uh, to pay back because it's not really going to be his problem. Somebody else is going to have to worry about whether I can service that loan. So he's going to say, so, so, and, and by the way, he's going to borrow from you in order to make his next loan. And as collateral, uh, he's going to uh, show you that on his books are a set of assets which are just as shaky as the asset I just described to you. Uh, at the same time, uh, you're going to come to uh, the gentleman next to you and you're going to say, I just took this loan out from this guy and it's based on these mortgages that are from the subprime sector and I'm really worried about this loan. This loan might fail. I'd like to get loan insurance. And so this guy says, I'm going to insure that loan and he's going to put up some collateral and, and his collateral is going to be just as screwed up as mine was. And so what we have now is a vicious cycle where shaky and toxic debt becomes amplified throughout the whole system. The checks and balances are supposed to be in that system to ensure that these kinds of practices don't occur were ignored. And I'll give you one great example. The Federal Reserve, by a mandate, is supposed to monitor subprime markets. If they believe that the sub, and by the way, the subprime real estate market is the market where people with shakier credit can get loans. So you can imagine that you have to monitor it uh, because uh, if the, if the uh, amount or the quality of those loans uh, uh, gets to be too uh, uh, shaky, then um, uh, you, you could be looking at a, a, a massive uh, a default like we, we got, and that could ripple through the system. Well, yeah, it could, and it did. But we happen to know that in the, in the early 2000s, uh, members of the Federal Reserve were going to Chief Greenspan and saying, it does look like there's problems in the subprime market. They're the kinds of bad loans that we talked about. These loans are being packaged in, in, in securities, called mortgage-backed securities. These loans are being packaged with other loans. They're being sold all over the globe. And uh, it doesn't look like the people at the end of this chain can actually finance these loans. This was in, in, in 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, these, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Federal Reserve uh, was uh, um, uh, failing, failing, uh, demonstrably failing in their job to monitor the subprime market. So there's an example of not a failure of deregulation. It's not that, that somebody took a rule off the books that should have been there. There was some of that too. A failure to enforce regulation. So basically, the the borrowing problems that the 3% of, uh, of, of, of uh, subprime loans that have defaulted so far have been amplified throughout the, the economy in the way that I just described. And I can say more about that during Q&A, but I'm getting near my, my 15 minutes here, so I want to just sort of wind down. So uh, the bubble then, the, the bubble bursts. Okay, so this, this scheme I told you about with these three people, you know, he takes, uh, he uh, uh, lends, lends uh, me money to buy a house. He turns around and sells that loan to her. She gets the loan insured by him, collateralized by more of this bad junk. Oh, that system uh, can only work as long as home prices keep rising. 
the bubble bursts, they stop rising. We can talk about why, but that happens. The economy uh, starts to uh, hit a recession. The direct effects of the bubble bursting mean that there's a whole lot fewer construction jobs. It means that there's a whole lot fewer jobs in financial services, putting these whole packages together. And you, know, you begin to have a, a, a slippage in consumer demand. Now this economy is 70% is consumption. So if consumer demand starts to falter, uh, you've got a problem. And remember, the middle class did very poorly over this period. I told you about their, their income growth based on a weak labor market, weak la wages, this inequality problem I've been talking about. The middle class did very poorly over this period. Once the wealth effect from the uh, appreciation of their homes shifted into reverse, the top heavy problems in the economy, over leverage, inequality, weak employment base, uh, were just uh, too much uh, for the system. And, and we entered a recession, uh, I think, probably uh, uh, early uh, this year. Um, at this point, uh, so that, that, that's where I think we are. Now, so at this point, we've, had, we've gone through a period, if you, know, if you ask me one, 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 a couple of words to describe the economic mechanism that got us where we are, I would say that, that, that we underpriced risk. When he sold me that loan, it was a much riskier loan than either of us wanted to believe. When he turned around and sold that asset, his asset to somebody else, it was a much riskier uh, asset that she took on, and, and she didn't know that. Uh, and, and that underpricing of risk reverberated through the whole economy. I mean, this is an economy, I'm still enough of a card-carrying economist to know that it actually matters whether, whether price signals are accurate or not. And risk was underpriced. Now risk is overpriced, because that's what happens. We swing back the other way. So now all these banks are too nervous to lend to each other. They don't really know the extent of exposure from any one of these loans because if, you, if, you, if, if, you, if bank A loans to bank B, they don't know that bank B is gonna be in business tomorrow, so they're nervous about that. There's a, a, a real loss of confidence in the system. And all of this uh, uh, stuff that's going on in the Federal Reserve every day, you read about some new trick the Fed is up to. Basically, the way I look at this, is that right now the Federal Reserve is doing their best to imitate the nation's banking system because the banking system is really quite frozen. Not completely, not to the point where you can't go and, and do retail banking, although sometimes your retail bank isn't the bank it was yesterday. Uh, uh, so we, you know, we've had 13, at least 13 banks fail this year, uh, but that, that, that's actually been okay. It's not that, that we can't do retail banking, it's that, it's that the behind the scenes flows of credit aren't occurring because of all the uh, uh, risk exposure I talked about. So the Federal Reserve is plugging themselves into the system and they're saying, um, we are, uh, we're, we're going to uh, be the nation's, not just central bank that operates behind the curtains and, and make sure all the deposits are where, what they should be in, in, in the commercial banks. No, we're actually going to take the role of, of, of banker, uh, of lender of last resort, of buyer of last resort. For the first time in its history, the Federal Reserve got into the commercial debt market yesterday and they bought unsecured debt, which is, means you and me as taxpayers are now holding debt that is not collateralized, which never happened. The, the, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve was T-bills. It was the most pristine balance sheet in the, in, in the country. And now that balance sheet is exposed to losses like it's never been before. And by the way, the balance sheet of the Federal, the Federal Reserve's assets now are 10% of GDP which is, is miles above what it usually is. So the Federal Reserve is stepping in to play the role of, of, nation, of, of, of the nation's banking system. And that's actually, uh, I think, uh, uh, what they have to do right now. Um, it's, a, uh, it's not an enviable position to be in, but uh, keeping the skids moving is important. Let me just wind down uh, 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 with uh, uh, what I actually believe is, is a... Uh, uh, getting back to my book, um, and, and both this book and the last book, is, is a note that I think is actually uh, pretty hopeful. Um, in writing these books, I've actually written nine editions of State of Working America. We just got a new one. Uh, at, um, the, uh, uh, the, the Crunch, of course, but also before that, uh, um, all together now, Why Do I Feel So Screwed? I've been writing these books for years. <laughs> I don't want to say I, I, I you know, I, I predicted this would happen, and, and you know, I, I, there are other people who predicted it more uh, foresightfully than I did. But what I did predict, what I did predict, 
was that the, a, a system that was uh, uh, so unregulated, a system that was so in, unequal in terms of the benefits of growth was unsustainable. And I wrote about this in my last book and I called it uh, yo-yo economics, you're on your own. And this is the idea that uh, I think has been behind economic policy for so long and it's a real market fundamentalism. And it says markets are always the best way to solve whatever problems you're faced with. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're worried about being able to maintain your living standards in retirement, forget about a government program called Social Security. You need to privatize that program and, and, and turn, turn that fate over to the stock market, which right now sounds like a really terrible idea. Um, if you're worried about health care, don't think about a government solution. That's French socialism. Think about a market-driven solution because markets get this stuff right and government gets it wrong. In fact, no matter what you're worried about, here's a tax cut, here's a private account, and here's a push out into the private market. You're on your own, fend for yourself because that's the best way to tap the efficiencies that occur when you, when you take the handcuffs off the invisible hand and, and let, it, let it do its thing, you know, which is just sort of a... Um, uh, uh, th th and this, this I, 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 you know, I and others, and certainly us at EPI, recognize that that was absolutely wrong. It doesn't mean that you're a five-year planner, <laughs> but it does mean that there's a continuum. And on one end is, you know, Milton Friedman on steroids, and on another end is, you know, Stalin with five-year plans. And we're always trying to wiggle around where we are in that continuum, and I argue we've drifted far too far uh, down to the yo-yo end and, and need to move our way back. And here's where I'm going to uh, uh, leave you uh, with my final message. I am uh, very hopeful, very hopeful, that we are moving down this continuum in the way that we need to, away from your on your own, more towards a wit agenda. We're in this together. And uh, uh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's important. And if we're smart enough, we'll learn we'll learn the lessons that this period is trying to teach us. You know, I, I, it's always said the Japanese have this, uh, uh, apparently the word for crisis in Japan is the same as the word for opportunity, which sort of makes you think like the Japanese are really Pollyanna or something, but you know, it's a, it, we're, we're in this, this crisis and I'm trying to say that it's, you know, it's an opportunity, but it really is. It's a, it, and, and it happens to be, oh, I don't know, 30 days out until an election, where you actually have a pretty stark choice between a, 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 what I would argue is a more, more, more kind of yo-yo and, and, and a different uh, wit uh, approach to this. Um, I think the lessons that we've learned and that we need to make sure are embedded in our policy and in our thinking is that if the economy is not working for most people, it's broken. If the economy is growing, yet middle incomes are falling, the economy is broken. It's as simple as that. And you got to fix it. And I have some ideas of how to do that that I'd be happy to talk about. Supply side trickle down just doesn't work. Okay, lesson two. All of these I can talk more about if people want. I want to get out of the way and let Paul take the stage here. Um, markets unregulated tend towards speculative excess. You know, we are into what I call the shampoo economy, bubble, bust, repeat. Uh, we saw it in the 90s. To some extent, you might argue we saw it in the 80s, we saw it in the 90s, we've now seen it in the 2000s. Unregulated markets tend towards speculative excess, and the damage that these bubbles do is really deep. I've been trying to convince people of that for a decade. I think they're convinced now. Globalization is a force for tremendous opportunity, not just for us, but for uh, people much less fortunate than us throughout the world, but it also needs a regulatory framework. It also needs coordination. And the impact of globalization on jobs and on inequality here is real, it's damaging, and it's important to get it right. And thankfully, we're starting to recognize that as well. To say that globalization and trade actually hurts large groups of workers here is no longer heresy. And it doesn't mean that you're a protectionist or that you, don't, you want to build walls and you don't, you're, you're not, you're not pro-trade or pro-globalization. I am. As I say in the book, I wake up in a global, I, I, have my, I have two children adopted from China. I wake up in a global household every morning, often about a half hour before I'd like to. <laughs> we, need to make, we need to make more stuff uh, in this country in the following sense. Uh, Bob Kuttner points out that about 30 years ago, we used to have 20% of the employment in manufacturing and 10% in financial services, that's flipped. We now have 20% in financial services, 10% in manufacturing. Uh, for the last 
uh, 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 you know, decade or so, we've, we've really created some fascinatingly complex and interesting financial instruments. But we are importing wind turbines from Denmark. You know, something's wrong with that picture. Um, these lessons, I think, are fundamental lessons that uh, uh, are ours to learn. And if we do not learn them, woe betide us. And, and good for us that we're here talking about this tonight on the heels of an election where I think the stakes are precisely high in exactly these terms. Thank you very much. I've got a few questions, um, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience if we have time. Goodness knows how long we'll spend on these questions. Um, one to ten, Jared. Um, one renewed boom next week. Uh, nine, Great Depression. Ten, worse than a Great Depression. Um, social unrest, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, where are you? What, where, what range are you in? Uh, well, I, I'm, in, I'm in five. I mean, I, I don't think we're looking at uh, seven, eight, or nine, or ten. Um, I think what we're looking at is a long slog with um, uh, the economy uh, creeping along well below trend uh, uh, through uh, uh, probably late 2009, um, uh, but then uh, beginning to grow. Uh, again, uh, it's important to recognize that um, uh, we often get very excited as to whether uh, GDP is shrinking or GDP is growing. If the economy is actually contracting, we have, you know, uh, th th then we, we all think, you know, that's, that's bad. And if the economy is expanding, that's good. Uh, from the perspective of, uh, of, of working families, if the economy is growing at half a percent, or falling at, at a tenth of a percent, it really doesn't make that much difference. That kind of growth is much too slow to create the economic activity we need to generate jobs, wages, and incomes. So unemployment will rise through next year and maybe even as high as 8% by the end of the year. That's, by the way, that's Goldman Sachs' forecast for uh, 2009 Q4. Goldman Sachs. Yeah, I'm not sure. Forecast. I'm, I'm, Gee, maybe that's, not the right That's not the most reassuring uh, source you could have provided. Um, <laughs> Uh, so if it's a five, and, and five, I would say, is a quite a hopeful number. That's a, how many people here in the audience, I'll, I'll do this for radio, but how many people here think it's going to be worse than a five? How many people think five or less? So that was about 60% worse, 40% uh, uh, five or less. Uh, how many people are with Jared on five, just on five itself? Mm, so maybe most of those 40% are, are at the five level. How many people here think nine or 10, Great Depression or worse? Nobody, uh, one in the back. Uh, so, you know. What do you think? I, 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 uh, I won't take a position. I'm <laughs> a, I knew it. I'm an even, no, I'm an even hand, I work for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. We don't take positions on things like this. I ask the questions. Uh, uh, um, the uh, so so that's but I but I think it's hopeful so that would suggest that I think there's at least a high probability or a reasonable probability that it would be worse than five. Uh, given that, how is it going to work? That is, oh sure, how yeah. will this get fixed? And maybe we'll do a little bit about the mechanics of that because, as you all probably know, with every passing hour the proposals as to what the mechanics might be change and have changed today alone. Last night, John McCain making a specific proposal, then today, various people trying to figure out exactly what that proposal, that is, to, bail, to, to buy up the mortgages <coughs> themselves to the tune of 300 billion, what that would mean. But at any rate, with that... That's actually a pretty simple question. Uh, what has to happen for this uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, to get better, and uh, the answer is that uh, the uh, housing prices have to fall far enough to clear the housing market. Um, when the uh, a bubble occurred, uh, housing prices uh, just defied gravity for for years, uh, and of course that sent a signal to all kinds of builders to borrow all kinds of uh, money. Remember the over leveraging story and uh, build houses uh, uh, made out of anything anywhere they could. Um, there were bird houses in my neighborhood that were going for you know uh, uh, six figures, um, and uh, and so 
uh, right now we have, typically we have something like a four to six months in inventory in our housing market. Now it's closer to a year, maybe come down a little 11 months or so. Um, when ho housing prices have fallen about 20% nationally, I think more than that in Boston, if I have that right, um, and, uh, and, and probably have to fall another 10 to 15%. And, and there is absolutely no way out of that. And that's one of the things that I've been trying to inject into the policy debate. We should and, and have to do uh, everything we can to, to help in, you know, hold innocent bystanders harmless. I'm a big advocate of, of Keynesian stimulus to uh, replace the demand that's lacking from, from the economy now with, with, with the kinds of boosts that that, that entails. But there's simply no way around, no way out of that, uh, of that large and painful correction that has to occur. And housing corrections take a long time. Uh, the IT bubble, when that burst, that correction was a lot faster because you held this piece of paper, this equity in some, you know, pets.com firm or something uh, that, uh, that was, you know, worth something one day and worthless the next day. It doesn't work that way with the housing market. You still have people sitting across the table trying to figure out, you know, should we renegotiate this loan or not because I don't want to uh, write down the principal if I'm the lender, you know, and I don't want to lose the home if I'm the borrower. So this correction's taking a long time, and it will take a long time. But uh, uh, I, I, my hope is that uh, um, that uh, correction I I occurs over the next couple of years. So if housing prices go down, your colleague, our friend Dean Baker, um, colleague broadly defined, uh, says that there, that there will be a drop in housing prices from the peak of $8 trillion. Is that right? Well, that's the change of housing wealth. Yeah, house, yeah. housing wealth. Well, yeah. that, would, that would be the same yeah. thing, would it not? Um, that's the aggregate amount of housing wealth that we would lose, so yes. Right, yeah. and... Uh, I'm talking about median home prices, you know, like the Case-Shiller Index or something. Right. He's saying if you take every single house and you figure out how much... Even the ones that are not for sale, you Yeah, yeah that, that's right, all, okay. all the ones, yeah. That, but, but, like but then we're Your house, my house, they're all, you know, they're worth less now, right? Right, so, but you're talking, so of the houses that get, sold, that get sold or cleared, to use the, the economics term you used before, they would clear at a price that something like, what's eight trillion as a percentage of what the current housing wealth is in this country? Uh, oh, I, you know, it's it's not trivial. It's uh, it's the current 16, housing. Sixteen, twenty, yeah, so twenty percent, maybe something. Twenty, like that. twenty trillion. You mean? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, something like no, no. I oh, think it's, it's more that, than that. It's more than that. It's 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 probably more like forty trillion. Oh, all right. So eight, so eight trillion. That would su suggest a dr a total drop of twenty percent. Yeah. Now. So if that happens, and it gets down to that price, then houses will start selling again. The mortgage, the, all those securities, that is the loans that were collateralized, had, had the mortgages as collateral, will then be worth 20% less, and it'll all work out. That's your, that's well, your I mean, scenario. I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's it all work out in the sense that there will be a lot of people who lost on making bets on this stuff, but it'll work out in the sense that the, um, uh, uh, the, the parts of the market that are frozen now will thaw. That's what I mean, work out. And it's, do you expect that there will be many more casualties in the financial system before that happens? Because yes. we've known, we've, the, the actual case Schiller market, there, there's a market for housing in the future. You can bet on what the house price will be in the future. And that's been predicting about a 10% a year decline. So then presumably everybody who looked at the market would know that would happen. And yet we've lost the largest insurance company in the country. We are losing banks. Uh, and as you say, the Federal Reserve is doing things it has never done or some would say dreamed of doing, like buying up unsecured, uncollateralized loans. Uh, do you expect a lot more of that to happen before we hit to 20%? I'm afraid so. I'm afraid so. I mean, the, the banking system is hugely undercapitalized. So what the Fed is trying to do and what this new bailout bill is, is Explain trying... Explain what you... Just for everybody to understand. Undercapitalized meaning... Over leveraged, undercapitalized. So that what that means is that the banks don't have enough uh, resources on hand uh, to service the accounts that they hold. Enough of their own money or their investors' right. money, the profits over the years. That's so right. Forth. So that, that 
when a bank, uh, uh, you know, when a bank falls, there's a run on the bank and it falls like what happened to IndyMac or most recently Wano, this bank goes from being solvent to being insolvent. And a bank that's undercapitalized is at risk of being insolvent in the sense that it cannot make its, it cannot pay its obligations to the folks uh, who uh, uh, have some kind of lien uh, uh, on these banks. And so there will be uh, 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 probably a lot more financial institutions that fail because of the kind of leveraging schemes I talked about earlier. There'll be, uh, there's, there's, let me see, you know, maybe something like three million people have have uh, experienced foreclosure so far, maybe four. Uh, you could, there, there's another 10 million that are underwater right now, meaning that their home values are worth, le worth less than their mortgages. Now you can be in that underwater situation for a while and, and get out of it if you have an income stream, but we happen to be in a recession. If you don't, uh, you're at risk of the fall. 10% of home, well, 3% of homes are foreclosed. Another 7% are late enough with their payments that they're at risk of default. So, you know, I would guess that another 10 million people could, could, could default on their mortgages. And the rescue plan in Washington, one is, of course, to take over insolvent institutions. Another one is to buy up loans, as you were suggesting, putting money that the Fed essentially creates or, uh, into the system to try to get banks lending. What is the other piece of, the, the key piece of this a uh, bailout or rescue plan? Well, okay, so this is the $700 billion plan that uh, you may have heard a little something about. Um, I would say the key piece of this, uh, certainly it's where, where Paulson started, and it never really, you know, all, all that Congress did was put a lot of, I think, important trimmings around this, but the core of the thing never changed. And the core of the thing was, remember I discussed this during the course of my talk, the, the, these idea that, that, that you would have, um, uh, a, a debt uh, that uh, you're a bank you're, or a lending institution, a mortgage lender, you're holding this debt that uh, is just uh, not uh, uh, performing. That is, it's an illiquid asset. Um, it's a debt that maybe it's a mortgage-backed security, so maybe it's a debt that includes a bad mortgage, uh, maybe in a different tranche it includes a bond or something that's not so unhealthy. But the point is that nobody really knows the value of this, and it's sitting on your books, and it's supposed to be an asset for you. It's supposed to bear, uh, and it's supposed to yield you an income stream, but it's not. It's, it's just, it's a loan that you're supposed to be earning money on, but the loan isn't paying off. The loan isn't paying off, uh, and, and so instead of being worth a uh, dollar, it might be worth 30 cents on the, on the open market. Uh, the bailout is such that the, uh, federal, uh, the Treasury now is going to go into this bank and it's going to buy that loan from you. It's going to take it off your books. It's going to pay you a premium instead of paying 30 cents on the dollar. It might pay you 60 cents on the dollar, which sounds like a bad deal from the taxpayer's perspective, and very well may be. But the point is that um, you do two things with that 60 cents on the dollar. One, you get the bad loan off the balance sheet of the bank so they don't have this uh, 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 a liquid asset you know, draining their uh, uh, resources. But at the same time, uh, you help to recapitalize them because you've actually paid them more than, than the market value on this. So that's the thinking there. So if, every, if that's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it to a fair thee well, and it's publicly announced that we're going to do it, then and the point of it is to get these bad assets or loans off the balance sheets of the books, bank, uh, yeah. of the bank, sorry, the toxic assets, so that the banks will now again be solvent, they won't be threatened, and then they can lend to each other because your bank and my bank now trust each other, whereas at the moment they don't. Right. Then my question is why at the moment don't they? Okay. Um, because, it, it, and just so everybody knows, I, last I checked this afternoon, the, the actual cost of my bank lending to Jared's bank overnight, just because I'm afraid he's going to close up shop before that's morning. The, that's the answer. <laughs> I, I know, but I, I'm just telling you, the number is, was, is about, was about five and a half today, LIBOR, uh, five and a half percent, Five and a half percent, you realize what the odds, what that means, my estimation of the odds are that his bank is going to fail before morning, and of course, it's exactly the same because that's how much he would charge me for a loan. 
Banks, of course, never want to keep cash on hand. They always want to be reinvesting it like any of us do. Therefore, they're lending it out to each other. Sometimes they're a little short, need money, and that's why you have this interbank transfer. So why in the world? Because you, you just said it, because they don't, they don't trust that you'll be yeah, there but we know, But they know that Paulson and every other major country in the world this morning is in concert, the British, I think, partially nationalized about eight banks well, today. Okay, so why, if, 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 if there's all these guarantees in the system, why don't they trust it? That's a good question. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, yeah okay. that's that, where That's I am. a good question. <laughs> well, let, let me tell you, there's two, answer, uh, two things I, that you raised that I want to answer. First has to do with the Fed, second has to do with Lehman Brothers. Um, by the way, you know, the, the story that Paul just told, I think is a good way of explaining what the Fed is doing right now. Um, Bank A doesn't want to lend to Bank B for exactly the reason Paul said. Both banks will lend to the Federal Reserve, but they won't lend to each other. So I'm the Fed, I say, okay, A, lend to me, okay, B, lend to me, and then I'll, I'll right. lend to you. Right. So that's kind of what the Fed's, it's kind of an interesting interbank uh, function is playing. Um, there's not or or the Fed taking over the entire potentially taking over the entire financial system at least for a while, right? Yeah, I mean the, the they nationalized AIG, so you know anything's possible. Um, the uh, the the thing the the, the the reason why I think um, uh, banks don't want to lend to each other right now is because they don't necessarily believe that the uh, EESA, the uh, this, this new bailout, it's actually called, I forget the uh, uh, Emergency Something Security Act, but, but it's the TARP, it's the, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which is the part of this bill that we're talking about. They don't believe that the TARP will necessarily work. The language in the TARP is vague. They don't know, Paulson could go in by the way, it could be months before the TARP is up and running, um, but, uh, or, or it could be tomorrow. Paulson could go in tomorrow and pay um, market value for these loans. Now, there's no reason why that would make these banks feel any better, because if, 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 if market value was what they wanted to sell these for, you know, they could sell them tomorrow. Um, nobody's paying market value. So the, the idea that the Fed would come in and pay market value probably doesn't excite them very much. That means, it, that means they have to recognize big losses. I just wanted to interject. I mean, it is not clear, is it not, what market value would mean at this point? Right, right. There, there's, the, it, it's very hard to value these assets. But, but here's the other thing. Here's the other thing I think scared them. It's kind of an interesting point. So we're, every weekend for a while, Paulson and Bernanke were going to some institution and trying to look at its books and figure out what the heck was going on, trying to value these hard to value assets. And you know, every weekend they were coming up with some plan. Well, we're gonna save Bear Stearns because we're gonna give JP Morgan a bridge loan to help buy it. And we're going to save AIG by essentially nationalizing it, by pl you know, pl plowing all kinds of taxpayer dollars into this giant insurer. And we're going to save Fannie and Freddie because they're too big to fail. And we're not gonna save Lehman. And I think that really freaked a lot of people out. I think that, that not saving Lehman, letting Lehman go down, signaled that the Fed won't bail everybody out. Uh, and I, I think that that led to a, a level of, uh, of, of panic in the system. The, all, all, the, the, cur the credit crunch really deepened after that event. And I think that was a pretty uh, uh, um, a turning point. But you don't think that the Fed would let another Lehman fail at this point, do you? Uh, probably not. Probably not. But, but, but it's probably not. It's a probabilistic then, and, there. And, and that's where my quandary comes, and the, which is if the general feeling is that the Fed would not let another Lehman fail, why would the panic with, that started with or accelerated with Lehman's demise be as palpable as it still is. I, I think back to the great 30s economist John Maynard Keynes, who in describing the Great Depression, where they had a lot of smart people at that era too, trying to figure out what to do, uh, and it didn't end for a decade, and it was only World War II that we think now got us out of it, uh, by having so much government spending and mm -hmm. so much solidarity and so much deprivation during the 40s, the early 40s. So why might it not be true? Of course it might be true, but wh why do you think it's not true that the downward spiral of layoffs 
as you point out, of people who were already not prospering for years, decades even, their layoffs. They then don't patronize the local store, which has to lay people off. Then they can't even afford the mortgage payments at 20% less than the price at which they bought the house. That that spiral doesn't continue down, given the fact that right at the moment, with the most massive promises on the parts of governments through all over the world, that we're going to turn this around and push as much money as we can and lower interest rates as much as we can to stimulate the economy, doesn't yeah. seem to be reassuring people. Uh, well, part of it has to do with just basic good old-fashioned panic. I mean, there is this belief that um, uh, nothing uh, is working. Certainly, you see that in the market. I mean, there's no obvious reason why the stock market should be tanking uh, you know, every other day. Um, uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, there is, I think, a, a kind of a contagion that says nothing works. So I think it's a, co a combination of, of just generalized, you know, panic, loss of confidence in the system, lack of trust, and a sense that the, that, that the other guy's balance sheet might be as undercapitalized as yours. And ergo, you, you know, he really might lose uh, y your, y you really might lose your investment, and the Fed might not swoop in and make everybody whole again. So, but you, th but you think the Fed will prevail, and that will come at the point, th I mean, yes? Well, no, I mean, what I said, remember, a few minutes ago, I said there's going to be a lot more failures. Now, yes, but I mean, but eventually the panic will yes. stop. Yes. In the long run, we're all dead. No, in the long run. <laughs> yes, uh, that's, uh, uh, and, the, and, and it was in that context that that quote is often used. It right. was John Maynard Keynes who said it before the Great Depression, but the point was you have to do something sooner rather than later because in the long run we're all dead. I mean, I, I have a graph I've been showing to people lately. I didn't do a PowerPoint tonight, but uh, uh, that shows that, that it's between, uh, uh, let me see, when is it? Uh, over about the last year and a half, uh, the net worth of households, if you look at you know, assets, household assets, which includes their home prices, their stock price, everything, income, and you subtract their liabilities. The net worth of households, real net worth of households, fell $6 trillion over the last year and a half. $6 trillion. That was till when? As, that, as was as of, that was uh, as of the second quarter of this year. So that was over about the last year and a half. That real net worth is down about $6 trillion from around the early 07 to middle of of 2008. The middle of 2000. The middle of, that's right, that's not, that doesn't include the third quarter. The, that doesn't include the, 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 the most recent six trillion. You can't deleverage that much. You can't deleverage the, that much. You can't have that much of a loss of net, well, without, without, you know, deep economic pain. And the Fed and the, and, the, and the government with fiscal stimulus can do everything and should do everything they can to put the appropriate fingers in the dike and try to uh, offset the pain. But this is what happens when, when, all of those, you know, when yo yo, when we worship at the at the altar of yo yo economics for too long. Do, do you did you ever think that you were going to see the day that the Fed and Treasury, as a matter of course, would nationalize, in effect, nationalize no. companies like these? No, I just I didn't see this coming. But then again, neither did anybody else. No, but I mean, <laughs> could you have ever imagined it? It, no, I mean, I, I, I'm reading about things that I didn't even know they could do, <laughs> so I couldn't imagine it. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't know they could do it. <laughs> it, it uh, I'll, I'll open it up in just a minute, but I, I sort of want to just finish this line of, of questioning, because these questions I had jotted down and really curious to hear your answers to, and have been very interested to hear your answers to. Is this socialism? No, no. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say. I mean, I don't really know what that word means anymore. It's uh, I and, and state I'm, significant. Let, let me let is me. Is it significant? Significant. If if the United States, roughly speaking, about thirty percent of GDP in the United States is accounted for by government spending, transfers, and so forth. In Denmark, it's about sixty percent. We, at least in the United States, and Sweden is close to that. It, we in the United States at least think of them as socialistic right, con right. countries. Uh, are we Scandinavianizing America? Yeah. Uh, yes, but it's temporary. Um, uh, the, I mean, by the way, just to be clear, that, that 30% is 20% federal, 10% state and local. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, no, that's no, everything, that, sure. That, that, that's right. But um, uh, see, when I hear the word socialism, I'm, I'm, I come from D.C. You know, I'm in, ensconced in that particular uh, 
battleground. And, and socialism is like saying, is, that's, how you, that's how conservatives say they don't like your idea. That's socialism. Um, but this is, this is absolutely state intervention into markets in a way that you see more uh, in, in social democracies than you typically see here. I, I looked up QED. I, I looked up the, uh, the day before yesterday, I looked up the platform, 2008 platform of the Communist Party of the United States. There's still a Communist Party? I, I was amazed myself to find that out. But the three of them somewhere in a garret, although they, their numbers may be growing as we speak. Uh, Hank the, Paulson, card-carrying member. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, let me tell you that there is nothing as economically radical in the pro platform, 2008 platform of the Communist Party of the United States as has been done in the last several weeks. As God is my witness. There is nothing in there about nationalizing anything. Yeah, well, I mean, there's... there's there's no market fundamentalist in a foxhole. I mean, it's just, uh, that's, it's, it's true. Last question, and then we uh, then open it up. Uh, you were talking about being hopeful. You were talking about the huge income and rising income and wealth gaps that have been in this country. They are closing, are they not? You mentioned 1928 as the last high water mark. The, the, peop the people at the bottom will get hurt most, presumably, yeah. be losing houses if they do or whatever, but the actual gap is narrowing as we speak, no? Well, we don't know. I mean, probably. Um, we, th there's a lag in those data, but I will say this. Um, uh, by the way, the hopeful thing was when I got to the end of my speech, I saw a little line saying, get hopeful now. So I had to, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to check um, out to make sure this is yeah. true. Uh, <laughs> no, where is it? I wrote, I wrote it somewhere. <laughs> oh, it's over here. Uh, I'll, see, I'll find uh, it. I really did write it. Uh, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. Besides, I don't have my um, glasses on. Oh, here so it I is. Yeah, hopeful. And then I, I, I crossed it out. I just, it's hopeful, and then the word is crossed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be realistic. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the, the, this, if you measure inequality by the top, uh, by the share of income going to the top 1%, it came down actually very significantly in 2001, 2002, 2003, because what happened in those years was there was a bursting of a, of a financial, uh, a bubble in financial markets. And so there were huge capital losses. These numbers include capital gains, that is the gains that you make on assets like stocks or bonds. Uh, and so um, in, in that recession, inequality came down, I think precisely the way you're thinking about it. It's not 100% clear to me that that's going to happen this time because it's a different, like you said yourself, it's a different kind of, of bubble bursting. You've actually got large losses in terms of assets uh, throughout the income scale with people losing uh, a value in their homes. And, uh, you know, there are, for every, for, every, for every bad bet that somebody made, there was some other smart, you know, investor on the other side of that bet. And so there are hedge funds out there and, uh, and, and, and investment banks, the few that are left standing, that actually did, did pretty well. So I'm not so sure inequality is going to come down all that much. We'll see. Let's, uh, let's open it up, please. Uh, yeah, there's a mad rush to the... I, I've done this before. I've never seen that happen. <laughs> Uh, unless it was somebody from a political splinter party trying to make a statement. It didn't look like that this time. Please quiet everybody if you would. If we quiet because we, you know, we're on radio here. So please go ahead. Yes. Earlier as short your, as possible. Please. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned that there were not redistributional mechanisms in place earlier in the century to address the inequity between the highest and the lowest incomes. Could you talk about those? Sure. I, I will briefly talk about those. One of the factors behind the inequality that plagues us today and I think has played a, a key role in, in, in the breakdown of the system by leaving families so uninsulated is the absence of bargaining power. Workers simply don't have the ability to bargain for their fair share of the growth that they themselves are helping to create. Um, unions are absolutely a part of that and we have uh, a fewer uh, uh, unions than we used to. Um, uh, the, uh, 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 we, the economy is very rarely in what we call 
a full employment state uh, anymore. That is, there's always labor market slack in our economy. Labor supply tends to be much larger than labor demand typically, and so there's always slack. So in the absence of full employment, uh, 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 employers just don't need to bid workers' wages up to get to get them to stay stay on the job. Um, Minimum wages have fallen very low in most, uh, in many parts of the country, although there are lots of states, like this one, that have, have higher, higher minimum wages. Um, and, 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 and probably, the, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, unions, absence of full employment, minimum wages, the largest factor is globalization. Globalization, which is in my book, I, ha I am you know, a, ch a, a, a partial cheerleader for globalization and a partial critic. And the critical part comes precisely at this. Globalization really does put downward pressure on the bargaining power, the wages, the incomes, just the economic status of non-college educated workers in our economy. And by the way, people may not know this, but 70% of our workforce is non-college educated. That is, they don't have a four-year or more college degree. Yeah, even slightly more. The, uh, uh, I just want to remind people who are listening to Jared Bernstein discuss, uh, discussing his book, uh, Crunch, Why Do I Feel So Squeezed? Uh, I'm Paul Salmon from uh, the News Hour with Jim Larry. You, sir, please. The interest on the national debt, how, f how much has it changed since 2002? Um, the interest on the national debt is actually quite low right now, and I don't know what the interest rate is. Um, you may be interested, if, if, you know, from the Department of Answer, answer the question you can. Um, you, you may be interested, uh, it, it, are you asking about how much has the national debt grown or how much has the interest on the debt grown? Or both? Okay, I can't, you know, I don't know how much, uh, you know, the interest on the debt has grown off the top of my head. I do know that we've added about $4 trillion to the national debt over the last uh, eight years. Um, that's, it's gone from about $5 trillion to around $9 trillion. 46% uh, of that increase is uh, uh, the, 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 um, the tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts. Another 33% is the war, uh, which is all borrowed. And the rest is other government spending, like the Medicare uh, uh, prescription drug program. But you understand that the, the, interest, the r interest rate has gone down yeah. over the years, and therefore interest as a percentage of all of the economy, the interest cost, has been, as Chad was saying, moderate compared to the past. With what's happening now, all bets are off. Go enough. Government is able to borrow at extremely favorable terms right now, uh, which isn't always the case when debt is high, but it certainly is now. Let me just suggest that if it's 4% interest roughly and in $9 trillion, that's $360 billion a year, right? So Yeah, that sounds anyway, about right. Of course yeah, it's a little, it's probably high, it's higher than that. We, right. you, we can, it's anyway, prob probably I'm a net interest cost. I'm just offering a yeah. rough guess to people. Right, so 5% times $9 trillion and that's, Whatever. yeah, you'd have some Anyway, my, my question is a different arithmetic uh, example. So I'm not an economist, I'm a physicist, so I hope I can do the arithmetic right, but I'm sure you know these numbers, but The Economist had this very nice chart in one of their recent issues which showed that um, total uh, U.S. Uh, debt, you know, government and private, as a function of GDP was very constant at about 150 percent of GDP from around 1950 to 1980, roughly. And then, of course, total debt took off, as you mentioned earlier. And now it's up to, before this crash, up to about 350% of GDP. Now, it seems to me you're being a little too optimistic about the future, okay, in terms of the impact of deleveraging. Because if we do have to cut back on debt, and if we deleverage at all levels, government and private debt, and say we only went back halfway to, to the good times where it was 150%, so we cut back from 350 percent to 250 percent, that's 100 percent of GDP, or about 14 trillion dollars, okay? If we spread, you know, 100 percent of GDP, say, over 10 years, and deleveraged even over 10 years, that's a 10 percent cut in, in consumption for government and private each year. Yeah, what's wrong problem, with that argument? I'll tell you what's wrong with the argument, is that okay. you're, you're, um, uh, the argument assumes that the economy doesn't grow. No. Um, uh, the, uh, as long as, uh, it, what, what matters here is not, uh, what matters here is, are, are, are the relative growth rates of, of debt and GDP. I mean, you understand that. So, um, the, 
the idea is that uh, as long as the debt to GDP ratio uh, isn't uh, growing, um, which it won't, if, uh, if, if uh, we don't add to that debt at, at a rate of about more than 3% of GDP per year, uh, I think we'll be okay. Um, now, that won't happen in the next few years. In the next few years, debt to GDP will grow, I think maybe partly as you're suggesting. But um, uh, I think that uh, if, if, uh, if, if we take some steps that we have to take, by the way, the biggest problem in what you're saying has not, is, is a word that hasn't come up tonight, which is, is healthcare spending. The, the fact that's going, the, the thing that's going to drive debt to GDP in a way that you describe that would be pretty cataclysmic would be if healthcare continued to grow 2.5% faster than the economy every year. Healthcare spending per person, per capita, is growing 2.5% per year faster than GDP per capita, and that means every year we devote a larger share of our economy to healthcare. Right now it's 16%. By 2050, if you straight line it, it'll be about 40 or 50%, and that's, that's cataclysmic. So if we, um, uh, the only thing that has to happen, it makes it sound easy, the only thing that has to happen for that to, uh, uh, is, is to get that excess cost burden back in line, and then GDP, uh, I think debt to GDP will either be constant or, or, or perhaps come down a bit. Okay, well we should do the arithmetic offline, but even with growth, I couldn't be off by more than a factor of 50 percent, so it still seems to me it's an enormous cut in consumption, but as I say. And, that's where, and that is where skeptics are coming from, precisely, with regard to the, uh, what's, gonna, what's going to happen as a result of all this. That is the downward spiral that, that I was asking Jared about. Please, the next person, if you would. Yeah, um, <clears throat> actually, speaking of the national debt and the deficit, um, <clears throat> I know that your organization uh, <clears throat> does good work educating Congress, and I, I'm wondering, uh, is there something relatively new happening or that should be happening with regard to educating people in Congress about the fact that deficits are not always evil? Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, you talk about this in your book, the fact that deficits, A, sometimes are actually healthy if they're not too big, partly because uh, they can be focused on things that are productive for the economy and also productive for society. Second of all, deficits can Re help to to uh, attenuate a recession. And what I'm thinking of more specifically is that um, we've become so overly concerned about deficits that um, it, it could really uh, slow down the idea of having a big enough stimulus program <clears throat> to, to really get the economy moving mm -hmm. again, which could cause us an awful lot of, of harm. Those are great, great questions and great points. Uh, and yes, we, this is for, we are very much trying to bring that kind of education to, uh, 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 to Congress. And you know, you will notice that there are, are people who took the view that uh, uh, deficits, uh, that you know, you need to have a balanced budget, uh, who don't take that view anymore. Uh, Barack Obama, for example, has said, you know, I'd, I'd like to see us get on a glide path toward a balanced budget, but I don't think I have to come in and balance the budget, you know, day one, right. which is obviously right. really important yeah. given the economy that he or McCain is going to inherit. So, um, again, it's, it sort of gets a little bit back to the last question. Um, what uh, the arithmetic of this is that you, you, you simply want the deficit to be small enough that you're not adding uh, to uh, uh, the debt to GDP ratio. That is that, that the ratio of debt to the economy, that, remember deficits are, are, are these flows that happen every year that uh, um, uh, flow into the stock, which is debt. So um, every year you'd like to see a deficit that uh, uh, doesn't r raise the, ratio, the debt ratio of GDP, and that's a deficit that's, that's usually below around 3% of GDP. Happens mm -hmm. to be around where we are right now. It's right. going up right. for maybe 5%. Yeah. So yeah. we will be adding to the debt to GDP ratio. Right. Right. A lot of this depends, I mean, put the healthcare thing I set aside, but a lot of your talk, and I write about this in the book, a lot of what you're saying depends on what you spend it on. Right. You know, you can spend the deficits, uh, you, you can invest in infrastructure, for example, in, 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 in debt that actually leads to more growth. And that's, that's a perfectly legitimate thing right. for government to do. Right. Thank you. That's a good question. A um, couple aspects of the bailout, and, uh, and I do call it a bailout that I'd like to ask you about. I do too. Um, but also, um, it is socialism. It's, I think it's socialism for investors, socialism for the rich, by and large. And somebody said that... Um, why will capitalism always survive? Because they'll always resort to socialism um, in, in, a, in a crisis. Um, 
but not n nationalize health insurance, but nationalize AIG. Um, so about the bailout, I was displaced as a result of a mortgage foreclosure, and I want to put in a plug for renters that who occasionally get mentioned in all of this. Yeah. All of the people renting in my building were displaced and had to find other places to live. And the question came up as to whether or not so-called cram down, I think it's called, of mortgages could have been included in bankruptcy proceedings as part of this bailout. And it's my understanding, a number of people reported that Obama in particular spoke vehemently against having that included in the bill. And I wonder, first of all, if you could respond sure. to the general question of, of what should, why isn't that included, shouldn't it be, and why do you think uh, uh, candidate Obama was speaking out against it? And the second aspect of the bail, it has to do with the issue of equity and or warrants. And a lot of people talk about the Scandinavian model that when Sweden, I think in particular, yeah. was in this crisis and they did it apparently quite effectively. And it, it, apparently that's not part of the current bailout and why isn't it? Right, okay, you asked two great questions. Uh, let me see if I can be concise so we can get to, uh, to other folks. Um, I think Obama believed, rightly or wrongly, that uh, this was very uh, delicate legislation that uh, uh, would not get passed if it had uh, what uh, many uh, uh, congressmen and women viewed as this poison pill. Um, the idea that you can go into bankruptcy court and renegotiate a contract and get a cram down uh, is anathema to uh, uh, some of those folks who would be casting votes. And I think Obama's judgment was, uh, we ought to try to do something like that, but outside this bill. Um, the uh, bill does facilitate um, uh, the Treasury buying uh, mortgage debt and renegotiating loans through this Hope for Home Ownership Act, but it doesn't, uh, and, 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 and writing down uh, a principal uh, isn't part of that, as far as I know. So, you know, you have a legitimate uh, uh, beef. There are a lot, the editorial page of the New York Times is constantly hammering on this as, the, as a really important way out of this, and, and, and uh, I happen to believe there's something to it. By the way, the, the Barney Frank, the, the Frank Dodd bill um, uh, absolutely uh, allows for precisely this kind of mechanism. The problem with that is that um, the lender has to agree. <laughs> Right, the, the thing you're talking about, the borrower, can, yeah, sure. the borrower can come into bankruptcy court, but in, the, in Frank Dodd, the lender uh, has to agree to take a haircut, you know, get, uh, uh, reduce the principal of the loan, and then refi the new loan. Um, the other, the equity swaps. There's language in this bill. Could you just explain, uh, because I think most people do not know what warrants are. So just briefly, this is if you take over a bank, you get a, an ownership stake. You, the government, would get an ownership stake in the bank such that if the bank went up in value, had greater profits, you would share in that. Sweden did that in the early 1990s with its banking system and made money on the deal in the, right. at the end of the day. Now, this was not in the Paulson bill. Uh, uh, this uh, was an addition uh, to the bill. Um, and uh, the bill has two... Um, uh, or one, one very clear mechanism by which you buy debt and you get equity. That's what I described before. Uh, but there also seems to be language in this bill that suggests, depending on the interpretation of the next Treasury Secretary, that the Treasury Secretary, him or herself, could actually do the, do the Swedish thing, could actually take equity shares in the bank without buying the, the bad debt. Um, so, you know, the moral of this story is, it, and Brokaw had it right the other night in the debate, I guess last night, he said, it really matters who the next Treasury Secretary is. I mean, I guess it always matters, but it really matters this time. Thank you. Two more Good luck. Uh, we've got three more questions. You could make them as brief as possible and your okay. answers too, thank you. Yeah. Sure, very stimulating. And I just want to extend two things. One is the big picture, building out from Bob Kuttner, the shift from manufacturing to financial instruments. Mm -hmm. To me, the big change is we've learned, all Americans, to really live on credit and credit has produced lots of jobs. However, it has also produced deficit. To me, one of the most ingenious instruments is the American ability to sell, package these financial instruments which look so promising to the people who are selling us oil and dish pans and garden hoses and so forth. So my sense is that part of what jolted Paulson into action was really the realization that if our, the things we're selling overseas, our deficit, Mm -hmm. looks bad, it's got to be polished to look better. 
The other part is By the, the way, sorry, let me just say, que question? Th this, is, this is the idea that the, the Chinese sell us, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 tainted uh, medicine and bad, and bad toys, and, and we give them a lousy financial instruments right. in return. That's right. I know, so. uh, that's, sorry, go ahead. What's your question? And, and, and the second part, my specialty is housing for Boston. And there's a big difference between a house that cleanly goes into foreclosure and a triple decker that has tenants who are put out on the street or which poisons the other houses on the street. So I, I would say it's very hard to figure out how to price it until you know how this write down of value is going to be handled. You can handle it badly, each bank for itself, yeah. like the Deutsche Bank is operating, which messes up a whole street, or you can quietly just sort of bring it down and the other houses remain whole. And that's the, the previous speaker sort of gets at that. The equity is, is, is one aspect, but there are a lot of tenants caught up, at least in the Northeast, in this problem. It, it matters a lot how uh, these plans are, are implemented. You know, we, uh, Paul and I were talking earlier about John McCain announced this plan where the government comes in and buys um, bad, uh, the, 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 uh, bad mortgages uh, itself and pays full value for them, which is something I didn't understand at first. So, you know, I view that as kind of a, a very unfortunate transfer from the... Uh, from the taxpayer to the uh, these lenders, and 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 that seems over the top relative to a Frank Dodd kind of plan, where where at least you accept that there's you know a haircut in there, and all sides kind of eat some of the the losses. Yeah, thank you for this. It's been very very good. Well, thank you. Uh, I live in Congressman Frank's district. Oh. Uh, and uh, I was opposed to what he was doing very much from the very beginning, like many other people, I think couldn't believe that the original version of this was uh, going to be passed by a Democratic Congress, of all people, and certainly not our man. <laughs> you know, Barney's there to be the liberal watchdog and the fighter for the low people, low-income people and that kind of thing, and it's a, uh, kind of surprising to see uh, in that role, historic role. He held a, a town uh, meeting uh, in uh, Newton, uh, and I went to it, and he essentially said, when you're the party of the majority, you have a special response, a different kind of responsibility. And uh, he had to look at all these other kind of things that led him uh, to see things in a different point of view. So I guess the, I have two questions for you. First of all, do you think that the bailout in the second configuration was the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and then third, the second point to that is, uh, have we perhaps also given too little credence to the problems that are in this bailout, which we may not even know anything about? For example, executive compensations, mm -hmm. which they think are not going to happen. But New York Times reported yesterday 440,000 taxpayer dollars going into a retreat yeah. for AIG. So who's watching this? And, and okay. how, do we, how do we control this mammoth thing that we have set up? That, another, great question. Um, you know, I have to admit that I was in the you know, hold your nose very tightly and vote for this uh, because uh, not, the first, not the initial bill that Paulson trotted out, which just said, you know, I am God and let me do whatever I want. Um, uh, I don't know what he was thinking. Um, and, uh, the, uh, but the bill that ultimately was voted on uh, struck me as the, the best uh, uh, bill we were going to get for a situation that I judged to be extremely urgent. Not so urgent, by the way, that we had to do it last Friday. I, I would have taken another week or two and improved the bill in some of the ways that your question, I think, alluded to. I understand the executive compensation restrictions in, in this bill are going to be very hard to implement and, and are, are probably toothless, uh, which I think is, is hugely uh, unfortunate, even though it was largely a symbolic thing. It's an important symbol. Uh, but uh, there is something in this bill that got in there that uh, is, is worth knowing about that people don't know enough about. Um, there's a clause in this bill that says if these equity shares that we were just talking about in the last question don't uh, make the taxpayer whole again, don't allow the taxpayer to recoup their initial investments, um, then the president can go to Congress and levy a, a, a fee or a tax on the financial services industry until the uh, uh, investments are repaid. And that's, that's, a, that's a good clause. You can bet that the financial services industry will be lobbying the hell out of that clause you know, from now until it's, it's either out there or enforced. So, you know, we have, so oversight, as your question suggested, is critical. There are two oversight boards. They're staffing them up right now. I was on the phone 
two days ago with Barney Frank, Nancy Pelosi, and the, uh, on that phone call, w we said, you know, let's get the GAO involved in vetting these folks for conflicts of interest. So there, 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 there is a real attention being paid to the importance of oversight. Whether, but it's got to, we've got to be vigilant because, for obvious reasons. A quick question. You mentioned earlier the productivity of the worker in the, in the <clears throat> last 10 years or so grew. And my question is, how much of that is, is attributable to computers and automation as opposed uh -huh. to the worker themselves? Uh, about uh, two, th <laughs> I happen to know this. Um, it's interesting because to, uh, economists uh, have always tried to figure out what explains productivity growth or productivity slowdown. We, we usually can't, but we have a pretty good idea that the acceleration in productivity, which took place post-1995, starting around 95, it went from growing 1.5% per year to 2.5% per year, and that was the big productivity miracle. And before that, economists said, boy, you know, these computers just don't seem to be showing up in the productivity accounts. Productivity started accelerating. We started looking at, 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 at the uh, acceleration. It looks like about two-thirds of it has to do with IT, two-thirds of the acceleration. Uh, about, I think, something like half of that, so maybe a third has to do with the actual efficiency with which we make computers. You know, we, we manufacture electronic goods. Uh, they're, they're great uh, they're, there are great efficiency gains in that, you know, the whole Moore's Law thing. So about, and the other half, though, just seems to have to do with what's called um, uh, multi-factor productivity, which means uh, 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 efficiency that doesn't seem to come from actual capital investment, actually having, having you know, new stuff, but actually using that stuff in ways that we haven't before. So half of that two-thirds, so the excel, two-thirds of the acceleration would be information technology, and half of that, you know, one-third, seems to be just learning to use computers in efficient ways. I, I, that, that's my understanding of, of, that, of that research. So it isn't really the worker, the worker's working harder, and, but it's being... More efficiently. With, yeah. with computers. Yeah, that, and I think computers have, have contributed to the efficiency of the workforce. I don't think anyone questions that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I, I, let, me, let me follow up that question, and this will be the last question of all. Is it possible that the productivity you're talking about is actually a mirage? Or some of it is, a lot of it is, because after all, GDP is the final price of all goods and services in an economy which is now 83% or something services, of which financial services, as you point out, have been a growing and growing proportion and maybe those prices that foreigners were paying for our financial services and that we all ourselves were paying, which made it look like we have a big economy here given the same number of people, therefore we are more productive per person, that's all productivity is, uh, is actually uh, something of an illusion. Yeah, I don't think so. Um... I mean, we've tried to make some of the adjustments that you're suggesting to the uh, national accounts and find that it doesn't really change uh, the productivity story very much. I mean, if you don't believe in, it, 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 you'd have to not believe in the output to not believe in productivity, That's right? what I'm, yeah. that's what so I'm, you think, that's so what you, I'm not believing Yeah, in. so you think GDP hasn't been growing the way I, we I, say I'm, it has, I'm only, or you're I'm suggesting only, maybe it hasn't. I'm only asking that as a sort of a global final question because when we are now seeing that all the pro that so many of the profits, so-called, of the financial sector have not been profits at all, but were taken out before they were realized not to be profits. And the, the question would then it's yeah, occur no, to me Yeah, no, I don't think so, Paul. Rate. I mean, I think it's like the, 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 you know, the money that people were paying for these services was, and I think in an economic sense, you know, money that they believed at the time was was well spent, anything that go, you know, and, and, and deriving economic, you know, quote, utility from that. I mean, anything that's going up in smoke now is absolutely going up in smoke and being counted against our national accounts right now. So, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, you have to kind of disbelieve the way we've been valuing goods and services. And, you know, the folk, there, there, there's actually a, an interesting project on this at the Brookings Institution that's trying to look at service sector productivity to try to verify it. And, you know, the, the summation of made a ton of research is that uh, actually we, we seem to do a pretty okay job at it. <laughs> well, that's a hopeful note on which to end. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jared Bernstein.